Good morning, everybody. Just trying to get this all started. And just like this is a movie theater, if everyone can turn off their cell phones, we're going to have a wonderful presentation today. So for, I, I'd like to begin with just really thanking everyone for coming um, on a Saturday, uh, Saturday morning. We're getting a bit better weather, but still this is a wonderful opportunity for the community to come together, talk about fire, fire preparedness, uh, fuels reductions. Uh, obviously it's a uh, subject matter we're all very concerned about. So I'm, again, I'm just very thankful that we had so many people in attendance and uh, this is gonna be a great presentation. For, for those of you that don't know, my name is Nick Exline. I, um, I'm actually the founder of the Tahoe Climate Change Action Network. I work doing private uh, land use consulting work. Uh, and I'm also one of your South Tahoe Public Utility District board members. And I want to pass on a piece of really good information. Uh, Thursday, we actually had a, a budgetary meeting and we worked really hard behind the scenes. We were able to put together a budget that would allow us to install the fire infrastructure that's currently missing to 10% of our community to ensure that our community is as prepared for a fire as it can possibly be. So that was a really big step and there were some people in attendance today and without their support it wouldn't have happened. So thank you so much. A um, few just kind of housekeeping items. Um, You'll see the uh, cards on your chairs and pencils. There'll be people coming around. If you have any questions as this is going on, please write your question down, pass your card off, and then at the end of the presentations, there'll be a Q&A session, uh, and we can have, uh, you, you know, you'll be providing the questions that the panelists will be answering. And so, you know, why are we here? We're surrounded by trees. We live in the um, wild urban interface, and what that means is that we're a community surrounded by trees and we're at the front lines uh, for fire. We all remember the historic Angora fire in 2007. Since that time, you know, a lot of work has been done, but fire risk continues to accelerate. The, the images from paradise, I'm sure, are on everybody's minds, and that's what brought a lot of people here. So what we want to do is come together and create the most robust system we can possibly have for fire preparedness. Um, really what we want to get for, for the, the attendees today is we want to provide a forum in which you have a better understanding of forest management policies, um, forest initiations, including fuels reductions, and really how that imp impacts the, the wildland urban interface and beyond. So I really want to start today you know, with the Climate Change Action Network and say the, the nexus between climate change and forest fire. That is one of the reasons why the Tahoe Climate Change Action Network was, was started, is because for, for years since I got into the subject matter, the, the nexus between fire and climate change were, were clearly identified, were clearly established. Lots and lots of people, as I'm sure you've seen, didn't want to face that reality 15, 20 years ago. This is not going to happen. Don't pay attention. These are extremists. These people are alertists, and they're not trying to help you out. But we're here. We're here, and we need to, we need to deal with it. And so we need to act robustly, both to, to mitigate climate change and to adapt to it. And this is more on the adaptation side. And so one of the other items I really want to talk about as it relates to climate change and forest fire is, is the idea of cost. Because forever in my climate change advocacy work, I would introduce the idea of cost. Climate change is going to be inherently very expensive to you. You have a lot of people telling you, oh, you know, your gas is going to go up five cents a gallon. But you're realizing the cost of uh, climate change right now. I bet many people can tell you, can understand that your grocery bills have been going up. Other things that are going to be happening, as it, specifically as it relates to fire, your home insurance is going to be going up. Um, the cost for everything you do will be starting to accelerate as a result of climate change, and specifically as it relates to our community. Fire preparedness is going to be a huge cost, and that burden is going to fall with on us. And so we're going to have to work to address that. But the good news is, is the Tahoe Climate Change Action Network and a lot of our partners, we've had, we've had a lot of local and regional successes. We had the city of South Lake Tahoe and the Lake Tahoe School District commit to 100% renewable electricity. The um, city of South Lake Tahoe just signed the lead agency MOU for a solar assessment process. And what that means is that our partners that followed after us with 100% renewable commitment, Truckee in Nevada City, the city of South Lake Tahoe is now the beacon for the solar 
process that is ongoing in all our communities. Um, a lot of other significant things are happening. Again, the school district made a 100% renewable commitment. They're going to be having a board meeting at 5 o'clock at the school district buildings on the 22nd. And what that is going to be looking to do is putting together a financing package in which we can lower the school district's uh, um, energy usage by over 40% while simultaneously saving the school district anywhere from 2.7 to 2.2 million dollars. You know, I learned early on that you, <laughs> fighting climate change wasn't enough to just say you want to save the world. You also had to make it cheaper and easier for people as well. And so that's really where we are at now. And so, you know, we've had a lot of successes, but there are a lot of things we need to continue to do. We hope this is the beginning of a conversation, and I hope um, if anyone's interested in, in getting involved with the Tahoe Climate Change app, Network, there's a sign-up sheet before. We don't inundate you with emails. And really, we want to just work to, uh, to develop a community, a region, a country, and a globe that addresses climate change. Because as it circles back to us, that's also going to help protect us from fire. And with that, I would like to pass this off to our, our wonderful uh, El Dorado County uh, Supervisor, Sue Novosel, to introduce our um, panelists. Thank you, Nick. And, and I just want to say real quickly, um, El Dorado is, is quietly doing what we can. Um, right now, at this moment, we are building a two-acre solar farm down in uh, on the West Slope, and very proud of that. And we just passed an extensive uh, vegetation management uh, program that we're very proud of. And so, just you know, be understanding that we are doing what we can too. But I very much appreciate what uh, what we're doing here today. And thank you, Nick, and, and your group for for holding this. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. We have three very highly skilled panelists that are excited, excited and eager to talk to us about what they do. Uh, first is Christina uh, Restardo. Restardo. And I said it wrong after I said I would get it. Oh, darn it. <laughs> so Christina is the um, Forest Health Management uh, Manager at TRPA. At TRPA, she has the primary work, she has primarily worked on updating uh, forest management, forest vegetation policies, and code of uh, ordinances and is a leader of the Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership. Uh, prior to work at TRPA, Christina coordinated the Sierra Nevada region of the California Fire Science Consortium and conducted applied forest and fire ecology research across the Sierra Nevada. In August, Christina will be starting as the fire science and outreach professor at University of Nevada, Reno. Reno, go pack. It's my alma mater. Yes. Thank you, Christina, for being here. The next we have Kyle Jacobson. Kyle earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of California, Berkeley. Go Bears, that's my dad's. Oh, oh you were a bear before you were a pack. Okay, all right, I love it. I like this California, yeah, go Cal. Um, so Kyle graduated uh, studies at, um, at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, um, and Kyle's worked for the Forest Service for 15 years. He started his fire career on a hotshot crew, very cool, and has worked in fire and fuels uh, research and prevention and on the Lake Tahoe, in the Lake Tahoe Basin on fire and fuels management since 2009. Kyle is currently the Assistant Forest Fire Management Officer for the United States Forest Service's Ta uh, Lake Tahoe Management, Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit. He is an active member of the California Interagency Incident Management Team as an operations section's chief. He lives in Myers, yes, go Myers, with his family. I know you gotta cheer on all this. You know. <laughs> he lives in Myers with his family and enjoys outdoor activities whenever he gets time. Welcome, to Kyle. And then finally we have uh, Forrest Schaefer. Forrest is the Forest Science and Management Coordinator for the California Tahoe Conservancy. And I love it, it just fits that you have a forest in the forest. I always, I always giggle when I hear that. <laughs> uh, he also serves as incident commander of the Lake of the Tahoe Fire and Fuels team, an organization which coordinates uh, fuel reduction, fire, wildfire prevention, and the community engagement and, and community engagement for 20 uh, local, state, and federal entities in the Lake Tahoe Basin. Um, let's see here. Oh shoot. There we go. Forrest is a California registered professional forester and has worked in wildland fire suppression and mitigation for over 15 years. He was the lead uh, editor uh, of the Community Wildfire Protection, fire, uh, Protection Plan for Lake Tahoe Basin. 
and is actively engaged in numerous interagency fuel reduction, forest health, fire prevention education, and prescribed fire initiatives. Thank you, Forrest, for being here. And that's it. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Now, so we're going to go on, I believe, to and, and have them speak. Okay. So, you, Christina, you want to go ahead and start? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let me find my talk here. Forrest organized it well. All right. Well, hello. And... Great introduction from Sue. She makes all of us sound a lot smarter than I think maybe we are. Um, so, so, so today I want to give you all an, an overview of kind of the forest health issue and ecology in the, in the Sierra Nevada and Tahoe, and also speak a little bit about some of the policies both in the state of California and in Tahoe itself that we're trying to change to better address this forest health crisis we have in the region. So it's important to understand and to remember that the ecosystems of Tahoe and the Sierra Nevada are fire adaptive ecosystems. So historically, we would have fires in the Jeffrey Pine Forest here in Tahoe every seven to 11 years, right? So we had frequent fires that were low intensity. So that means that not very many trees, big trees in the overstory died when we had those fires. But instead, historically, what those fires would do is actually maintain healthy structures in forests. So they would come through and kill all of the small trees in the understory or the ladder fuels, right? Right now, outside, in, in a lot of areas that have not been thinned or burned or, or treated for fuels, you'll see that there's a lot of thick trees in the in the understory that allow any fire to carry through and get into the canopies of the trees. And that's why we get these large, high severity wildfires is because we have so much of that buildup underneath. Now, what it used to be is that we'd have so much fire that we wouldn't get that buildup, right? And so what fire would do is it would not only remove all of those fuels in the understory and kill those small trees, it would also consume all of the dead branches that fall down through time, all of that would be burned up in those low intensity fires. Also by having fire, it also maintained structural complexity in the forest. And why is that important? If you look at the image here, that's a, an example of historically what a forest would look like. And that structural complexity is good for wildlife habitat, right? Because you have openings, closed forests, open forests, et cetera. And that's good for just having a diversity of environments for animals to live in the forest. And it also just made the forest more resilient when there was a fire because it didn't all look the same. So when the fire came through, it wouldn't kill everything in the same way. It might kill a couple trees over here and a few trees over there because the forest was spatially complex. And so the, the key here is that fire played a very important role in maintaining the structure of the forest and the processes and the functions that are so important in our forests. So in the history of, 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 of Tahoe, we have these fire adapted forests and then we logged everything, right? So we completely denuded the landscape of all of the vegetation in the late 1800s save a few small areas where they didn't log everything, but for the most part, it was very, very heavily logged. Now, what happened is that as those forests grew back from being logged, they didn't have any fire in them. So they grew back without fire. So here is a, a great, it's a, this isn't from Tahoe, this is from Yosemite National Park, but it, it's a great image that shows on the left what it looks like now, it's actually probably the 1990s, in Yosemite, and on the right, it was historically significantly more open, as you can tell. So as forests grew back, they grew back with significantly more trees because they didn't have the fire that came through to kill some of those trees and keep the density low. So in the 1900s, early 1900s, the big burn happened, which was essentially a large swaths of Montana and and Idaho burned down in a giant wildfire. So then the Forest Service was like, whoa, 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 we're losing entire communities of people. People are dying. The forests are burning down. 
we have to really suppress fires, right? So this is part of that story of as our forests grew back, we didn't allow the fires to naturally occur, and that's how we get those dense forests that we do today. On top of that, we built homes in the dense forest. So now we live, all of a lot of us here, I'm sure we all do, live in the forest, in what we call the wildland urban interface. And Tahoe is pretty much all wildland urban interface, right? We, we all, there are homes and communities all within the dense forest. So as the forest grew back without fire, we moved into them and created more of a risky situation, if you will. And that brings us to today, where we're having a forest health crisis in the Sierra Nevada, where we had last numbers I saw, I think is 165 million dead trees throughout the Sierra Nevada, started in 2012. The real peak of it was 2012 to 2016, but we're still seeing trees slowly die. Now, we didn't get as many trees in Tahoe because we're higher in, in elevation here, so there's, there's more water, it's, it's more moist. But we, did, we have seen 100,000 trees die here in, in Tahoe um, in the past five to six years. So we still have seen a lot of trees die in this area as well. And we're seeing a lot of mega fires now, right, where it used to be that we would have a wildfire here and there, but now we're having giant wildfires that are more than 100,000 acres in size. That's the definition of a megafire, more than 100,000 acres. So 2018 alone in the state of California, uh, over 7,500 wildfires, 1.8 million acres burned, and 22,700 structures destroyed. This is a figure that I got from CAL FIRE. And that's pretty staggering, right? So, oh my goodness, we are having trees die, big fires, losing communities. It's a big deal. And we've got climate change also happening. And this is just a map to show you guys, and you don't have to get into the specifics here, just focus. No matter what models you run and look at, the red is showing that we're expecting to have more drought. These are more months of drought in a 30-year in a 30-year time frame. So as you can see, no matter how you slice it, we're planning on having more drought in California and Nevada and the Southwest. And so this dynamic with climate change is important because we'll say, well, gosh, we had a wet year this year. We had all kinds of snow. Last year was also pretty good. So what's the big deal? Well, when we have these wet years, and then we have dry years, what happens is we actually have a lot of production of fuels, so grasses, needles, et cetera. So the forest actually produces more plants and vegetation when it's wet, but then when it's dry, all of that new growth becomes fuel. It, it, it becomes more easy to ignite, and especially the grasses will actually spread fire quickly in grass and then into the forest. So this variability between dry years and wet years is going to be something that is more and more important in a fire, in a fire context, because we'll see that that actually increases the risk and the danger. So having that up and down where, oh, it's wet, now it's dry, it's wet, it's dry, that's a bad situation for fire. So what can we do about it, okay? It's, it's a hard situation. So how should we be managing our forests and what policies have to change to make this management able to happen. Well, we know from both uh, seeing it on the ground and loads of scientific studies have prov proven that thinning and prescribed burning our forests makes them more resilient to fire and to drought. Actually, I have a new paper that just hit the streets two days ago that, that shows not only are these actions that we take to, to to reduce fuels and then the forest good for fire, they also make our forest more resilient to drought and to insects because if we can remove the amount of straws in the cup, right, the forest, the trees in the forest are like straws. They're taking all of the water out of the soil because they need that to grow. Well, the more that we have, the more demand there is for water. So as we remove those trees and reduce the density in the forest, we make the forest more resilient to a whole suite of stressors that they face, fire, 
climate change, drought, and insect attacks. So here's just an example. Forest A here is, is an area that was thinned and prescribed burned before the Angora fire. And in Forest B, it's an area that had had no fuel treatments and no fire. In the Angora fire, five, we only had 5 to 15% mortality of trees in Forest A, but Forest B had 80 to 100% mortality. So as you can see, when you really change the structure of that forest and make it more like Forest A, like the forests of the past that had more fire in them, they're more resilient. That forest, Forest A, is more resilient to fire and climate change and drought. So we're really trying to get that type of work done on the ground where we're thinning and burning to really modify the structure of the forest. So what are some things that are, that are happening in the region to respond to this need? Well, there was a report that, that CAL FIRE, and I'm speaking a little bit to some of the CAL FIRE work because Chief Anthony was supposed to be here, but he was unable to. So I, I'm adding in a bit of California stuff as well for you guys. But this report, it essentially investigated, okay, what are the policies and the procedures happening in the state of California and how do they need to change? And essentially it said leaders need to review existing forestry practices and procedures, including the California State Forest Practice Rules, to assess whether they facilitate resiliency in a changing climate. So key point here is that there's essentially been a directive from the state of California that everybody needs to be reviewing their policies and procedures to make sure that we're able to get this work on the ground to make our forests more healthy. And so that started with essentially um, this, this bill, Senate Bill 901, which it essentially did two main things. First, it provided relief to private landowners who had fuels on their land that they wanted to treat. It used to be historically that they had to go through a much larger process to permit anything that they wanted to do, and that was very expensive and took a long time, and now there's some relief there for them to make it easier for private folks to thin their forests. Second, and this one's really important, and I think that Kyle's also going to speak to this, there's a lot of money in the state of California that gets used on fuels projects on Forest Service property. Now, Forest Service has to do NEPA, which is the National Environmental Protection Act. It has to do a large, lengthy environmental review process to conduct any work on their lands. Now, California has CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act, and any projects done in the state of California have to have CEQA done. Now, these are documents that are this thick, environmental impact statements that show all of the impacts of the fuels work you want to do, et cetera. Now, it used to be that if you used California state funds to do work on federal land, you had to do NEPA and CEQA, which is just a very expensive and lengthy process that takes a lot of time and makes it slower to get work on the ground. From this bill, now CEQA does not have to be done if California state dollars are spent on a project on, on federal lands. Now NEPA is enough. So that is a policy nuance that has changed, which actually has huge impacts on planning time and gets projects on the ground quicker. I hope I explained that right, and you'll explain it again. Um, now, there have been several executive orders that have come out of the state of California as well. Uh, one that was done in 2018, again, it's working to reduce barriers to get to entry to forest health and fuels projects. That barrier to entry is that NEPA CEQA process or other processes that take a long time to get projects on the ground. Now, just recently in January, the new governor um, said, okay, Paradise and the Mendocino Complex fire, these big fires, like we need to get actions on the ground now. And so what CAL FIRE did in response to that was they came up with this list of 35 priority projects. And on those projects, CEQA doesn't have to happen at all. They can get on the ground right away. And that's a very important uh, step towards just expediting work on the ground to treat fuels immediately. 
So how is my agency here in Tahoe trying to align with this push to streamline all of regulations for forestry and fuels projects in the region? Well, just as a reminder to folks here, after the Angora fire happened in 2007, TRPA did change a few, a few rules that they had in place. First, they changed rules about how many trees you can remove in a, in a, in a project. It used to be if you wanted to remove more than 99 trees, the governing board of TRPA had to approve that project. Again, it's this lengthy time to get a project on the ground. Now, the staff level can say, that's fine, do that project, and work with our partners under the, the memorandum of, of understanding that we have, for example, with the Forest Service and the California Tahoe Conservancy. Also, they increased the diameter limits of the size of tree that you're allowed to remove on your own property without a permit. So now that is a 14-inch size tree. Anything below that size, you can remove yourself without getting a permit. Now, I will say, 14 inches and above, you need a, a permit, but I've never heard of anybody not being able to get one. We have excellent foresters that work both for TRPA and the fire protection districts that can come out and issue that permit. So that shouldn't be a problem for you as a homeowner. So we're also working with teams in the region to help expand fuel treatments to the quote unquote landscape scale. That means instead of doing smaller treatments of 100 acres here, and 100 acres there, we're actually taking our planning to the next up much, much higher scale to try to, to treat entire swaths of the forest. So for example, all of us are, are, are part of the Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership, where we are planning fuel treatments and watershed restoration on 60,000 acres in West Shore Tahoe. Uh, we're also working with partners to, to streamline the review process for projects. And we are working specifically to revise our code of ordinances for vegetation management at the TRPA. In that revision, that will include re-looking at what types of equipment you can use on uh, steep slopes. Right now, there is a limitation in our code that you can't use mechanical equipment on, on steep slopes, and so we're really to take a big look at that. We're also emphasizing the use of prescribed fire and making sure our partner agencies have the latitude to get that work done. And then again, expanding across the whole landscape instead of small projects. So to close here, we've always, in the, in the forestry and fire world, looked at fire with the fire behavior triangle. Fire is controlled by weather, topography, and fuel. And we've always said, well, the only thing about that that we can change is fuel, right? We can modify the fuel on the landscape through thinning and through burning. But I propose that it's a little bit more nuanced now. It's not just the ecological piece, it's also the economic and the social, right? And so there's a lot of work that we can do on the social side of that in the policies and the public acceptance, et cetera, for using fire and doing fuels work on the landscape. So really thinking about the three legs of this and that the social part is a huge piece of it. So necessary actions to really see through that we can really start to, to tackle all, all three legs of that triangle is we need the public support and the, and the outreach through education. We need to streamline our policies and the regulations to get projects on the ground quicker we need to strategically treat fuels on the landscape. We need to use fire as a tool. We need our communities to be safe when fire comes and adapted to fire. And we need to really have a place for the biomass to go. And that's a huge thing, and I guess that Forrest might talk about that a bit, but we really need an opportunity to have somewhere to take all that wood that we are, that we're taking out of the forest, because that right now is a challenge for us. So anyways, I'll leave it at that. and. I think we're taking questions afterwards, right? So I'll, um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Quick announcement on questions. That's what the index cards are for. So just uh, write them throughout the presentations. And if you have one ready, just raise it in, and uh, Harold or others will take those from you. Yes.
All right, while I'm getting, the, getting this ready, I want to just say thanks to Sue because it usually takes me about 10 minutes to spit out my title and the agency I work for, so that saves me half of a presentation here. And uh, thanks to Tina for setting that up. That goes uh, really well into what I want to talk about today and uh, looking at a little bit more of why we do what we do and how we do it on in the Lake Tahoe Basin and the surrounding areas. So it works really well. Tina gave you a good background into why we're in the situation we're in, and now we're going to look at what we're doing to try and get out of this situation a little bit. So in the Sierras, most of the Sierras, we're really lucky because with one treatment, we can achieve multiple objectives. And I'm going to talk about all of these a little more in depth. But a lot of places, if you're trying to reduce fuel, you're trying to reduce the risk of catastrophic wildland fire, you may be sacrificing vegetation. You may be sacrificing forest health. You may be kind of changing the local environment. Here in Lake Tahoe, we can actually benefit the ecology. We can benefit for reducing the risk of catastrophic wildland fire. We can reduce fuels. We can restore meadows. We can restore stream environment zones. So one treatment gets us multiple benefits. So we're really lucky here. And we know what that treatment is. So let's, let's get more of them going. And I'll show you a little bit more on each one of these. So the important thing that everybody in this room can do, that all of your neighbors can do, is improving defensible space. These areas are throughout Lake Tahoe. Tina talked about the wildland urban interface. We can do as much treatment as we want on federal and state lands, but if we don't have the defensible space around the homes, it's really hard for firefighters to protect those areas. So even if we've done a lot of work, but then you have trees right up against your homes, we get embers getting in that area, and the treatment's not going to be as effective as it could be if the work around the homes was done. So reducing the risk of catastrophic wildland fire, this is what we're really trying to do with these treatments. This has been the number one driving factor in the treatments around Lake Tahoe and throughout California. And what are we really doing? We're reducing tree density. Tina showed a slide that showed the Angora fire. When we reduce that density, we reduce the continuity. We make it so that the crowns aren't connected anymore and so the ground's not connected to the crowns also. So when we remove that continuity, we reduce the fire behavior and the fire severity. So by removing trees from the area, we're actually making that a less intense fire that makes it easier for firefighters to go in and protect your homes. We're reducing that surface fuel load. So you can see in a lot of areas in Lake Tahoe, we have tremendous amounts of fuels that are on the ground from these kind of decadent forests, just trees that have been left lying on the ground. We have duff and litter accumulations, so the actual pine needles on the surface floor are getting deeper and deeper as time goes on. So these treatments, we're trying to remove that and make sure that we get those surface fuels off the ground. And that's going to reduce the severity of the fire. The longer a fire burns, the more impact it has on the vegetation. So if we can remove some of that, we're going to have less impact on the vegetation and have healthier trees for longer. And we're also looking at reducing that crown fire risk. When we talk about catastrophic wildland fire, that's typically what we're talking about. We're talking about these large crown fires because those are the most severe fires. Those will have 300 foot flame lengths. And as a firefighter, there's nothing we can do about it. Aviation resources are not going to be successful in putting that fire out. Ground resources can't get anywhere near that fire. So until that fire behavior changes, there's nothing anybody can do in that situation. So that's really what we're trying to do, is reduce that risk of crown fire. So improving forest health. You know, a lot of this is going kind of over what Tina went over, but I think it's really important that we, we go through this, that stands have become overly dense. They ha have a high susceptibility to insects and disease. Um, so what are we doing? We're trying to lower the competition for nutrients. We're trying to have higher drought tolerance, and we're trying to lower that mortality. Doing all of those things makes our forest more resilient to fire in the future. So lower risks of mortality. It's going to lead to less surface fuels. As we're doing all of these things, we're reducing the risk of catastrophic wildland fire. So this is what I mean. We have multiple benefits. Our forests are going to be healthier. They're going to be here for future generations to go ahead and enjoy. But we're also going to reduce the risk of catastrophic wildland fire. We're going to protect our communities. So we're getting multiple benefits out of all of these treatments. So how are we doing this? There are two main methods that we use in Lake Tahoe for removing fuels. One of them we call mechanical treatment. That's the use of heavy equipment on the landscape. Tina mentioned we're only allowed to do this on slopes that are less than 30%. So you're going to see lots of areas where we don't do mechanical treatment. This is our preferred method 
of treating fuels because we can take the fuels in one step and remove them from the landscape. Whereas if we're doing the other treatment method, which is hand thinning, we have to do a pile and burn after that. So it's kind of a two-step process versus just being able to remove the fuels in one step. Um, mechanical treatment's not suitable for all areas. It's not just slope. Um, we have sensitive areas that the soils are very fragile, so we can't do mechanical treatments in there. We have wildlife limitations, so we can't do certain mechanical treatments in areas that, that we could be impacting the wildlife. So it's not an acceptable treatment method everywhere, but we have figured out how to use it more places than most uh, areas do. Whole tree yarding or whole tree removal would be what you would typically see in what we would call a timber operation or what you would be used to from a 70s or 80s treatment where they're dragging the logs across the ground. We don't do that in Lake Tahoe very often. We use a method called CTL or cut to length and that's where we actually cut the logs with a, a harvesting machine that goes in ahead of time and then we'll bring tracked equipment in and they'll lift the log onto the back of that equipment so we're having less of an impact on, on the ground. You can see uh, the picture, and I'm not sure if one of these is a laser, but uh, you can see right here, this is a, an example of that type of equipment. So you have you know, some rubber-based equipment that actually moves the log onto the back so that we aren't dragging the logs on the soil and we're reducing the amount of damage that, that could occur from that type of treatment. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about pile burning. This is something most of you are probably well aware happens quite a bit in the Lake Tahoe Basin. This is an example of a machine pile. And I wanted to show this slide to bring up a point that just because we're doing mechanical treatment doesn't always mean that we aren't gonna do pile burning afterwards. Tina brought up economics. That is a big deal. So right now there is a limitation in the amount of facilities that will accept biomass in Lake Tahoe. So a lot of times the cost of actually taking chip and removing it from the Lake Tahoe Basin, hauling it somewhere, is it's, it's extreme. So even if we subsidize that work that's going to be occurring, there's no, there's absolutely no profit and there's no way for us to pay for all of that material to be removed. So sometimes we have to burn it on site, unfortunately. And that's because there are only two facilities in the immediate area and those facilities aren't always taking material. So Tina talked about improving our biomass utilization and that's something that we really need to do to try and make sure we're utilizing all these material and eliminating some of this extra work that doesn't need to happen. This is more traditional of what you'd see in Lake Tahoe. This is a hand pile and burn. So this will be uh, usually on slopes or in sensitive areas. We'll go through and we'll use chainsaws and hand crews to thin the forest out and then we'll come back and we'll do a pile burn. Typically these are consuming slash and we're just trying to remove fuels but we get an added benefit. As we're removing those fuels, we're reintroducing fire into this fire-dependent ecosystem. It's allowing for new pines to come up in the forest floor. So it's another one of those where the same type of treatment gets us multiple benefits. How do we usually do this? Most of you have probably seen piles on the landscape. We try to get to them within five years. We have a one to three year curing process. So there is always a delay. We don't want to go out and burn green material. That produces excess smoke, and we really do try and manage smoke the best we can. I know most people in this room have had some smoke impacts, but we really do everything we possibly can to manage smoke. And part of that is allowing those piles to dry out for a little while so that they burn cleaner and we can reduce the amount of smoke that, that's being produced. We also restack those piles. We call this process chunking, and that's just to try and remove more material. Piles don't burn 100% cleanly, so we'll repile that material back into the pile to try and get more of that material uh, removed. And we also allow what we call pile creep, and this is really to try and reintroduce fire into the ecosystem. We can have a, lot, a bunch of little dots in the middle, and that's just where we burn the piles, but if we allow those piles to move from pile to pile a little bit, we're removing some more of those surface fuels. We're reducing the litter and duff layers. So we're trying to get fire back on the landscape and not just isolated to individual areas. So we're, we're trying to encourage that when it's safe to do so. And this is just another slide about the wildland urban interface. This is where 95% of our treatments have taken place. And I just want to kind of give you a little different look of what's happening. There's the interface and the intermix. Almost everybody in this room lives in one of those two. They're very different from a firefighting perspective. Interface is 
homes directly adjacent to trees or forests or the, the environment. Whereas intermixed, you're in between the two. So you have homes that are in the forest. And guess what? In Lake Tahoe, we have a great combination of both. Um, this can be extremely difficult for firefighters when you're trying to put out forest fires, but then you also have structure fires that are going on at the same time, and you have different people with different specialties trying to work on both at the same time, different types of equipment. So I just wanted to point out that we're, we're kind of in a spot where we have a little bit of everything when it comes to doing wildland fire protection. Um, you can see here on U.S. Forest Service lands, and Forrest may go into a little bit more about the basin as a whole, but on U.S. Forest Service lands, in the wildland urban interface, we have completed approximately 80% of treatments on the land. Not that that means we're done, because all treatments have a, have a length of time that they're considered effective. In Lake Tahoe and most of the Sierras, treatments are usually effective for about 20 years. So we're going to need to go back in and retreat these areas, but we've at least done initial entries on approximately 80% of the landscape in the wildland urban interface. And we have treatments planned on 100% of the landscape. So that means we've done the NEPA for the entire Lake Tahoe Basin in the wildland urban interface. And that's something we're really proud of. It's, it's been a lot of work, but we're, we're finally getting there. Oh, I do have urban lots. Have ever, is everybody familiar with what an urban lot is in the room? No? Okay. Well, that's uh, something very unique to the Forest Service in the Lake Tahoe Basin. We have small parcels that were purchased by the Forest Service. CTC also has ownership of several of those. And they're, they're lots of neighborhoods that are meant to keep the openness of, of Lake Tahoe and not have just home after home after home. Those require extensive management because we realize those are in between people's homes. And we're now on the second entry in all of our urban lots. So we've placed a lot of emphasis on making sure that we treat those urban lots and we go back into those urban lots to help keep neighborhoods safe. And if you do have an urban lot next to your home, you can come speak to me afterwards. We have created a process for homeowners to help with stewardship and helping keep those urban lots clean and keep their defensible space in their homes. So treatments, this is just a treatment map. Um, I wanted to show you, these are all the fuels treatments that have taken place around the Lake Tahoe Basin. And you can see that here in South Lake Tahoe, we've done quite a lot of work and we just completed a CE last year to do even more work. So we have another 4,000 acres of mechanical treatments that are gonna be occurring in South Lake Tahoe in the next two to three years. So there's been a tremendous amount of work done around the Lake Tahoe Basin. Um, most of these treatments are for fuels, but I wanted to point out that we do treatments for aspen restoration, that we do treatments for meadow restoration, that as Forest Service, we're a multiple use agency, so it's not just fuels management. But the great thing about the Sierra Nevadas, meadow restoration, guess what it does? It also reduces fuels while making our meadows, meadows healthier. Aspen restoration, same thing. We're removing a bunch of trees, a bunch of conifers, making our aspen stands healthier. Aspen is naturally resilient to fire. They're usually moist areas. Fire behavior decreases in aspen stands. So it's another one of those. We get these multiple benefits doing these treatments. So it's great living here in Tahoe sometimes. We can get all of these benefits from the same thing happening. Um, authorities, so the one thing I wanted to bring up on the federal authorities, something we have that's very unique to the Lake Tahoe Basin um, that was pushed through uh, Senator McClintock, Congressman McClintock, changes, um, was very instrumental in pushing that forward. Uh, we have a 10,000 acre categorical exclusion, which means we don't have to go through the same lengthy NEPA process. Tina spoke of these, you know, five to 800 page documents, which is something we typically have to do. Because of this 10,000 acre categorical exclusion, we can do that same document in less than six months and less than 200 pages. So it gives us, allows us to have the ability to treat 3,000 acres mechanically and 7,000 acres by hand pen in an expedited process that goes, goes through NEPA. So that's been a really big help and we've been using that pretty extensively for the last year or two. And Tina did a great job of explaining um, kind of the NEPA CEQA crossover and I just wanted to give an example of one project. So we have Meeks Meadow project that we've been working on for several years. It took us five years to get through that NEPA process. And then we decided we wanted to partner with the Washoe tribe to get that treatment done. They got a state grant from California to do the work there but guess what, since that was state money and it's not being done by a federal agency, they had to go through the entire CEQA process, which has now taken them another three years to get through. 
And so we're looking at possibly starting treatment this year or next year. But that's an eight-year process for something that could have taken much less time than that. And this new crosswalk should hopefully expedite that process. Thank you, Forrest, for these slides. I'm going to talk a little bit about fire in the, the Lake Tahoe Basin itself, just switch over from fuels reduction and why we're doing it to, to here's, here's, can, here's what happens. You know, this, these fires, those were just typically one burn period. You know, the Angora lasted for a few days, but most of the burning was done in one burn period. So we can have these large catastrophic wildland fires that happen in eight hours. We get winds over 15 miles an hour in the Lake Tahoe Basin, and as firefighters, we start worrying because at about 15 miles an hour is when our ground troops aren't typically effective, and the fire behavior is just too much for us to get in there. Aircraft becomes less effective because they can't get in there as well either. And we get eight hours of that, and this can be what happens. When we see this, you know, we have the Angora fire in here, 3,000 acres pretty much in one burn period. But guess what? 3,000 acres in today's mega fire is absolutely nothing, right? I mean, that is, that's not even really a fire in what we do. Last three years, I haven't had a season where I haven't been on a fire that's over 100,000 acres. Yet how dramatic was that to our community? You know, how much damage did that do to our community? And how important is it that we try and get in front of this problem? Here's another look. Not only now are we looking kind of at the Lake Tahoe Basin, this is looking at the west slope of the Sierra. Does anybody know what fire that was? King fire. I, I was detailed down on the El Dorado when that was going on. Extremely stressful. That ran through the Rubicon drainage, 40 or 50,000 acres in about five hours. That was by far the most dramatic run that had ever occurred in California at that point in time. Guess what? That's happened three or four times in the past three or four years. So that is not uncommon anymore. When that occurred, it was like, wow, this is never going to happen again. That type of thing happens every year. So here's a look at Lake Tahoe again. Um, 2010 to 2017, we had approximately 400 ignitions in Lake Tahoe. And those are various types of ignitions. Those could be smoking, those could be children, power lines, um, campfires. So there's a number of different types of ignitions in Lake Tahoe. But one of the things that you notice when you're looking at this slide is, guess what? There's a high number of ignitions in this area. Do you know why that is? More people. We have more people in South Lake Tahoe. If you look up in here, you know, the areas where we have the most ignitions are where we have the most people. People tend to be careless with fire. And that's one of the messages we're trying to get across. We know most of the local residents realize the damage that fire can cause to a community, so are very careful with fire. But we have a lot of visitors, too. And how do we get that message across to visitors to make sure that we're all careful with fire and that we can protect the communities? We have a really strong prevention program. We have a, a fire public education team that's trying to get the message out. But a lot of times, it's going to be local community members that can help get that message out when you see your neighbors that are being careless with fire. If you're seeing somebody not put their campfire out or having an illegal campfire, help us send that message because there are not enough of us to get to everybody to make sure that that's clear and how much damage that could do to our community. And that's all I have. So thank you for your time. transitioned. Once again, my name is Forrest Schaefer. I work for the California Tahoe Conservancy as the Forest Science and Management Coordinator. And I also have the privilege of serving as the incident commander of the Tahoe Fire and Fuels Team. Um, I'll provide a little bit more detail on the Tahoe Fire and Fuels Team, but what the Tahoe Fire and Fuels Team is, is really a partnership of the agencies and organizations within the Tahoe Basin that are collectively working together on our joint goals for fuel reduction and wildfire prevention. Um, I started up in uh, North Lake Tahoe, up in Incline Village, and working a lot directly with communities 
on a prescribed fire program, on a defensible space program. And a lot of that work has really shaped my perceptions of what the role a community can play in our fuel reduction and fire prevention efforts. And I think it's um, incredibly strong. And a lot of the policy that's been developed over the past um, couple of decades has really lifted the power of communities, both in decision making and prioritization and funding. And we see that shift occurring even today. So today I kind of want to provide an overview to start with of the management responsibilities in the Lake Tahoe Basin, who the players are, because there's a lot of players when it comes to fuel reduction and wildfire prevention. Then we're going to geek out a little bit on some policy, on what I see as some key federal law that has really helped to shape our partnerships, our priorities, and our funding in terms of what we're focused on in the Lake Tahoe Basin. Um, and then finally, uh, looking at some of the fires we've had in recent years in the state of California, is many of us that work in this field are asking ourselves really difficult questions as we're faced with difficult truths about what we're doing and what we may need to change, both in terms of policy and in terms of how we function as society to better be able to adapt to these wildfires. So to start with, I'm going to take you on a little tour of the Lake Tahoe Basin from above the Carson Valley. And the Lake Tahoe Basin is a really unique place that in some ways acts as a microcosm for many of the challenges that governments face throughout the nation in terms of managing across boundaries, aligning vision, aligning mission, and aligning the projects and the work that we do. And that's because in Tahoe we have two states and five counties. Within that, we have seven local fire protection districts. The local fire protection districts in the Lake Tahoe Basin have really led the way um, in the region, in the state, even nationally, in terms of the level of participation and the role that fire districts can take for building community resilience and conducting community mitigation. So most of these fire districts will conduct defensible space inspections, provide community assistance programs to their residents in terms of um, curbside chipping or financial assistance for defensible space creation, and also directly managing fuel reduction projects on those private lands. Because in between all of the state and federal lands, we have a lot of larger forested landowners where in order to build effective, um, effective forest management projects that reduce fire behavior, they need to be continuous and we need to think across property boundaries and the fire districts in the basin have taken the lead role in that process. We have two state forestry agents, agencies that both directly implement projects and have a regulatory role through the state's forest practice acts. We have other land managers like the Nevada Division of State Lands, Nevada State Parks, and California State Parks, which really provides that recreational nexus along with the Forest Service for our communities. Um, Kyle mentioned the urban lots. We have thousands of urban lots in the Lake Tahoe Basin, managed by three different agencies, U.S. Forest Service, the Nevada Division of State Lands, and the California Tahoe Conservancy. Um, the U.S. Forest Service owns 75% of the land in the Lake Tahoe Basin, an enormous role in providing that connectivity and that preparation for wildland fire. But after the U.S. Forest Service, the largest landowner in the Lake Tahoe Basin is Lake Tahoe Basin landowners, private landowners. And so considering the role of both government lands and of private lands um, in the fuel reduction project development process is critical. And also part of this are the educational institutions, Cooperative Extensions and the Tahoe Resource Conservation District in providing that link to the community to align the work that we're doing within communities with the work that government agencies are accomplishing. So this is a lot, a lot of agencies in one little, one small place. Um, and so that's the uh, one additional layer. Our regulatory agencies, Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and the Lahontan Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, provide unique regulatory overlays in the Lake Tahoe Basin 
And so we, as implementers, need to coordinate very closely in terms of implementing the work that we need to accomplish while still providing those safeguards for wildlife, for water quality, et cetera. And that is why we have a Tahoe Fire and Fuels team to be able to coordinate on all of the intricate aspects that must go in to any community engagement or fuel reduction project. We already saw that picture. So now we're gonna go into a couple of key policies as I see them. The first is the Healthy Forest Restoration Act of 2003 signed into law by uh, George W. Bush. And this is where I'm gonna break that cardinal rule of not putting too many words on a slide, but I, I, I'll go through this quickly. But I wanna go into a couple of key pieces because what the Healthy Forest Restoration Act did is really codify many of these concepts around the wildland-urban interface, the prioritization, and how local communities can work with government landowners to really build shared power in terms of prioritization and the work that we can accomplish together. So, wildland-urban interface, the first codified definition in law of WUI, wildland-urban interface, was in the Healthy Forest Restoration Act. And one of those definitions of WUI is it's an at-risk community and it's those areas that are identified in a community wildfire protection plan. A community wildfire protection plan, which needs to be developed in partnership with communities, federal and state and local government agencies and fire protection jurisdictions, actually defines the community basis for what the wildland urban interface is. So, why is that important? The legislation directs the U.S. Forest Service to consider the recommendations that are made by communities in their community wildfire protection plan, which means that the work that government agencies do, this provides the basis for the community to actually play a part in directing that work and identifying those priorities. And then the second key piece is that most of the funding that we use in the Lake Tahoe Basin, whether it's on state land or private land or federal land, are federal funds. And the Healthy Forest Restoration Act spelled out that any financial assistance under any provision of law for hazardous fuel reduction projects on non-federal land, that communities have developed community wildfire protection plans shall have priority for that funding, which is why it's critical that we maintain our community wildfire protection plans, make them relevant and meaningful for the work that we need to accomplish, because that is the basis for which funding can be utilized, federal funding can be utilized to accomplish those goals. So in the Lake Tahoe Basin, I will take it back to the basin now. Um, we have two primary pieces that really provide the basis for our partnership in how organizations work together with the community. Um, the first is our multi-jurisdictional strategy for fuel reduction, um, which is a, a 40 pages or so, and, and both of these documents are available on the Tahoe Living With Fire website at tahoe.livingwithfire.info. And then the second is the Community Wildfire Protection Plan, which really goes into those details and provides community-developed action plans for the actions that need to be taken to reduce our community's risk of wildfire. So now I'm gonna tell a success story in terms of how this legislation has influenced the work and the landscape in the Lake Tahoe Basin. On the left, you'll see in red the, the boundaries that were defined in the first community wildfire protection plan in the basin back in 2004 and then adopted by our strategy in 2007 of the boundaries of the wildland urban interface. Kyle earlier talked about the difference between interface and intermix. And this is an example of how our agency policies in terms of how we're implementing law have shifted over time. And you'll notice that in the 2007 version on the left, that the wildland urban interface assumes that there's this divide between neighborhoods and forests, neighborhoods and wildlands, and that the focus needs to be on that strip surrounding communities. We really recognized 
through our community wildfire protection planning process that we do truly have an intermix in the Lake Tahoe Basin. And you can see on the right that that boundary is expanded to go all the way from the wildlands to the shore. Because as we've seen in multiple fires, even areas internal to communities are exposed to embers. Um, they feel the effects of a wildland fire, and it's not just those homes on the very margin that can, um, that can be damaged. So I want you to look, I'm gonna flip back. Take a look at that wildland urban interface boundary on the right, and then look at all of those polygons in blue, which is completed, and some of the other colors are planned work. That represents the completed fuel reduction treatments. As Kyle mentioned, 100% of the federal treatments in that area are planned, with about 80% of them complete. The shape of our landscape and the shape of the treatments were defined in our community wildfire protection plans. The U.S. Forest Service planned those projects and has implemented a majority of those projects. And state and local government agencies are filling in those pieces in between those federal lands. So in thinking about guiding policy and how we implement it, it's the strength of those partnerships that actually enables us to take those laws and that guidance and really enact it in a way that has a meaningful benefit for our communities. Can I get a quick time check? Um, I think you have two time, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next piece of legislation I want to go into is the Flame Act of 2009, which totally coincidentally, I'm sure, stands for Federal Land Assistance Management and Enhancement. I love how they come up with those. Um, but what the Flame Act was, was a response to skyrocketing costs and vastly increased acreage burned every year and corresponding damage in terms of structures lost that accompanied that. And the Flame Act directed the federal government to work with state and tribal and local government and community partners to develop a cohesive strategy for how to adapt ourselves to our new, very hot, smoky reality. And the results of that were three really simple goals in that cohesive strategy. First, restore and maintain fire resilient landscapes. And this is really the piece of implementing those strategic treatments throughout the landscape that help build the resilience by reducing the potential fire intensity. Second is creating fire adapted communities. And I think this really represents a philosophical shift. And I really appreciated, Christina, your new fire behavior triangle because it recognizes that modifying fire behavior might not be our only solution. And we really need to look to how we adapt our communities in terms of social and economic actions to deal with our new wildfire problems. And third is supporting effective and efficient wildfire response. Kyle showed earlier that we had 400 ignitions in the span of seven years. 400 ignitions where many of those may have had the chance to grow into a much larger fire. And it's by taking this triple-pronged approach of fuel reduction treatments that help maintain fire-resilient landscapes, working within communities to create defensible space, prepare for evacuation, and supporting a really effective and efficient wildfire response force means that we're reducing the likelihood of any one of those ignitions becoming that next damaging wildfire. We can improve our odds, um, but we, uh, we can't make any guarantees. So bringing some of that in terms of how that's influenced our projects with the Flame Act, when we updated our community wildfire protection plans, the community adopted those same three goals of the cohesive strategy as the goals for our community wildfire protection plan and our multi-jurisdictional strategy. And the first piece I want to look at, and we'll kind of start from the communities and work our way outwards in terms of looking at some of those specific challenges as well as accomplishments, is this map shows um, 
on the left show some of the patterns of land ownership within our neighborhoods because of all of those state and federally managed urban lots. The key question for us is how do we ensure when we're working in these areas with this patchwork land ownership that we're not just thinking about, okay, we treated Forest Service land or we treated our conservancy land or we had some defensible space. How can we ensure that the work is being accomplished across all ownerships so we're taking this neighborhood and moving not just parcels or lots into a fire safe condition, but the entire neighborhood into a fire safe condition. And really our approach to doing that is through the Tahoe Network of Fire Adapted Communities, which is a partnership managed by the Tahoe Resource Conservation District and the seven local fire protection districts, along with the state and federal land management agencies to be able to align the community assistance work in terms of inspections and public outreach and focus that on those high risk neighborhoods so that we're accomplishing work across jurisdictions and really changing the character of a neighborhood in terms of how well it will be able to respond to and recover from a wildfire. The evacuation piece and response piece is a critical com component. And so Lake Tahoe Basin agencies have undertaken a pre-attack planning process to look at structure defense plans and developing them prior to that fire arriving and using that to understand some of the traffic flow patterns, critical assets, potential places for, um, for temporary sheltering and incorporating that into evacuation and response planning. And third on that, on that piece with fire adapted communities is really ensuring that the public has the tools that it needs um, in order to be able to respond and prepare to wildfire and to prepare for prescribed fire and have the awareness of where that, that work will be underway. Um, so information on um, both fuel reduction projects and prescribed fires is available through the Tahoe Living With Fire website. So I'm gonna skip past these pieces pretty quickly because um, Kyle covered it, thank you. Um, but what are we thinking about beyond the wildland urban interface? And beyond the things that happen beyond the wildland urban interface still have a substantial impact on our communities. And through the cohesive strategy in our community wildfire protection planning, and now through Lake Tahoe West, we're not just considering communities as where people live. In terms of our landscape, our identity as, as people in the Lake Tahoe Basin, the basis of our economy, the air we breathe, the water we drink is all dependent on our landscape and a wildfire can have significant impacts beyond the immediate damage to homes that might occur. So Lake Tahoe West Restoration Partnership is taking that approach in terms of how we're planning forest management projects, along with how we're planning community engagement and assistance work to really look at our landscape in the Lake Tahoe Basin as something where there's really no line between where communities start and where landscapes end and landscapes begin. And things that we do within our communities to build our resilience to fire help improve the landscape. And things that we do to help improve the landscape help improve our communities. So looking at future policy needs, this is where we're starting to see again that evolution and that shift. Where for many years our efforts were on let's protect communities, and let's restore landscapes. And we have different organizations and projects to focus on those pieces. But really looking now to integrate communities and landscapes and codify how that interaction occurs and how that might change what our priorities are in terms of what actions we take. So next piece I wanna go to is, um, I, I was, this picture is from the Carlton Complex in 2014 in Central Washington. And for many years, Central Washington had been focused on mitigation and prevention actions. But when the Carlton Complex came through, destroyed hundreds of homes, they totally had to shift focus 
to what do we do after the fire? How do we help our, our socioeconomically vulnerable populations recover? How do we deal with landslides? How do we deal with revegetation or mitigation? And we too have been really focused on the mitigation and prevention aspects in the Lake Tahoe Basin, and it's incredibly important. But as we're looking at moving forward our planning, we realize that we also need to look at our community resilience and community recovery that may occur after a fire. Because we know we will see more large fires in the state um, with the impacts of climate change, we could see other fires in the Lake Tahoe Basin. We need to consider what we can do to improve our community resilience and recovery options. So this is not a picture of Tahoe. This is a picture of Ashland, Oregon. And over the last two years, Ashland, Oregon has been inundated by wildfire smoke. Last year, they had six straight weeks of unhealthy or hazardous smoke levels from wildfire. This is having drastic impacts on their economy. The basis of their economy, which is the Ashland Shakespeare Festival, is considering moving. We have been lucky to not have those sustained impacts in the Lake Tahoe Basin. But as we've seen with things like the King Fire and the Rim Fire, we can have sustained smoke impacts. And when we reach that tipping point, we may be looking at more um, health impacts as well as economic impacts to the Lake Tahoe Basin. So whereas before we may have focused on standalone solutions where you know, public health can work on public health issues, forest managers will work on forest management issues, fire departments will work on defensible space, um, we're seeing now the need to move to stronger linked socio-ecological solutions. And we do that by building the partnerships like what we're doing in this room today and those connections. So the final piece I wanna go into is we will be updating our community wildfire protection plans in 2020. Um, they were last updated in 2015. The concept of shared responsibility is something we're all really familiar with and we know that we all have shared responsibility for wildfires but the impacts of smoke the impacts of recovering from wildfire the strength of that shared responsibility is more clear than it ever has been but it's hard for us as as agencies to talk about shared responsibility without also talking about shared power Things like the Healthy Forest Restoration Act and the Flame Act helped to build, not recognize that we had shared responsibility and started providing those tools to actually share that power. So as we move forward, we need to consider in light of recent wildfires in California, who else needs to be engaged? What else we need to be focusing on? in terms of creating community and landscape fire adaptation. And today, I feel like we are building our political voice in the Lake Tahoe Basin to move for those changes that we might need to see on a state or a federal level and really to, in order to effectively move forward our priorities. So I am really looking forward to talking with anybody who would like to speak with me both during this panel um, and after this session. Thank you. All right, how about another big a round of applause for our excellent panelists. All right, so we have, uh, I think we have 45 minutes, right, for questions? And we'll try to get through all of them. Uh, talk to the panelists ahead of time. They each have you know, three minutes to answer, but just uh, with, with um, not lots of questions in mind, we'll, we'll try to be uh, right to the point and provide uh, everyone a response to the, the concerns that have emerged, one of which 
is insurance. Um, I think uh, we, we've heard a lot of stories of people not being able to get you know, a policy if when they purchase a home in high fire risk areas or, or being dropped. So just the questions are, do you have any ideas about how to prevent people losing their fire insurance or becoming too expensive and a related question, insurance companies seem to discount the benefit of defensible space um, and or canceling insurance. How are public agencies working with insurance companies to address their concerns? So who would like to take that one? I guess uh, I'll get started on that a little bit. There we go. Okay, we got it now. Um, so I recently just got a notice in the mail saying that I'm getting a non-renewal on my insurance and I've been speaking with uh, several insurance agencies about why this is happening and what we can do to change it. And really what's going on is the agencies, the larger insurance agencies that are underwriting the insurance agencies we have are getting out of the business. So, you know, Farmers has an insurance agency too that insures them when things get too expensive and they're getting out of that business. So basically anything within a thousand feet of vulnerable vegetation, most of these insurance companies are not going to insure anymore. So. Most of our agencies are working with the insurance companies to come up with models that are a little bit more predictive of potential fire behavior. Because right now it's a very simplistic model that just looks at ingress, egress, how close you are to flammable vegetation. So what we're trying to do is work with these agencies and come up with a model that actually looks at these uh, fuels reduction treatments and the amount of work that's been done and the type of fire that would actually occur in one of those neighborhoods and use that as another metric before they decide they're just gonna drop your insurance, but things move slowly. So right now, California Fair Plan is kind of the intermediate, and I know it's expensive. I've been looking into it myself, but until we can actually make the changes in how these insurance companies are looking at the potential um, damage from fires, we're, we're kind of stuck in the where we're at. I guess how do we add to that? Um, I got dropped from the house I live in and, and in escrow on a new home and having a hard time getting insurance for that home. So I, I understand all of these woes. Um, I do know that there has been some movement made in the state of California to um, essentially have insurance regulated in the same way. So homeowners insurance in California doesn't have like an insurance commission to regulate them in the same way that health insurance is, auto insurance is. So it's very strange that homeowner's insurance is kind of exempt from that oversight. And I know that Cal Fire and some folks in the state of California are pushing things at the legislative level to address this for the whole state of California. Do you want to add anything for it? No? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so in terms of some immediate actions that can be applied, um, it's so dependent on the insurance company and the nature of the notice in terms of follow-up that can occur. But each fire protection district in the Lake Tahoe Basin is able to respond upon request to conduct a defensible space inspection and depending on the insurance company can provide that once you've taken the follow-up actions to comply with local or state requirements. Um, to provide you a notice of that of that work. Um, the last piece is it's important that if you feel you're being treated unfairly within an insurance process to make that complaint to the State Insurance Commission. So lots of fun for everybody. <laughs> All right. Um, Christina brought up uh, and others uh, biomass, so we have a couple questions on that. What are opportunities for public entities to build or operate uh, facilities to address biomass, a related question. Um, do you have ideas on how to incentivize biomass energy production to make it uh, competitive with other renewable sources? And the third one was any, any uh, updates on the status of the biomass plant that was planned in the Truckee area? So those are all related. How do we, how do we make biomass energy happen? So public entities and facilities, what was the second piece of the question? Uh, well, that, that was well, how can public entities be involved in creating biomass facilities? Mm -hmm. Any ideas on how to incentivize biomass nice. energy production so it's a cost competitive? Um, yep, okay. 
That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so one of the challenges that we've run into consistently when looking to build agency partnerships that can produce new markets for biomass and wood products utilization is we always run into this wall, which is the fact that we're government agencies. And by nature, we can't build markets because that is the role of private investors. That's been a, a difficult lesson learned because biomass efforts have been underway in the Lake Tahoe Basin for many years with really only small improvements to show for it. Um, we currently have a biomass utilization working group in the Lake Tahoe Basin that again is still an agency focused piece, but our focus has shifted from how can we build markets to how can we provide tools? How can we provide the information on a consistent material supply that can be then utilized by private investors to be able to then build those markets so that we have those avenues for, for delivering this material? Um, one of the facilities that's in place right now is the Loyalton Bioenergy Facility run by American Renewable Power. And I feel like this is a really useful example because they have 30 acres ready to take in new tenants that can utilize wood products from a variety of sources while using the energy, which would be essentially free from the byproducts of production that from burning that material for biomass to energy. But the unfortunate part is that it's been really difficult to make biomass to energy really pencil out in terms of economic viability because the cost of power is cheap enough to the point where no matter how efficient we can realistically make our extraction and burning of biomass materials, it's always going to be a little bit more expensive than some of those other materials. Um, so providing that information to private suppliers and the tools for potentially making those investments is really a big focus. Um, so in terms of providing incentives um, for the utilization, I feel like a lot of that is, is somewhat of a larger um, state or federal policy piece to address. Um, but one of the drivers that we've seen, for example, the use of mass timber, things like cross-laminated timber in Japan and Korea, has been starting with local government, starting with government buildings and then building their way from there and really using that as a testing ground to prove the use of some of these products. Um, and then the last piece is the Cabin Creek Biomass Facility, which was planned in Truckee. Um, that never broke ground and it would have provided a useful avenue for being able to utilize some of these materials. But again, because of that cost limitation, in terms of being able to pencil out energy purchase agreements, um, they were not able to bring their cost of power down low enough to be able to sell it then to the grid. Okay, next question. Um, if there were more, if there was more money uh, directed to fuel reduction uh, projects, um, do the agencies have the capacity to use these dollars? And I think a related question is: Is there sufficient workforce available and are, say, more workforce development uh, programs, the community colleges and what have you needed to be able to use the dollars available? Yeah, I think Forrest and I can tag team this one a little bit. Um, I can tell you from the federal side, we have experienced a reduction in workforce. Um, we have a reduced capacity. There's nothing I can say that's going to change that. Um, that's just kind of the trend we've been on for the last few years and likely will continue on and because of that we are trying to utilize our partners and uh, do everything we can to work together to get that same amount of work or additional work done so we're trying to utilize different authorities um, the good neighbor authority different ways that we can continue treatment without the same amount of workforce we have because we realize as an agency by ourselves we aren't going to get the same number of acres treated however we have the CTC, we have local fire protection districts, we have state agencies, and we can contract with them. We also have other organizations like the um, NFF and, and places that we're going to to try and make sure that this treatment still continues at the pace that it needs to continue at, knowing that we personally don't have the same capacity 
we've possibly had in the past. We may see it again in the future, but we're just trying to do everything we can to help share that responsibility, knowing that federal lands are everyone's lands and it's not just a Forest Service responsibility. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna expand a little bit on good neighbor authority. Good neighbor authority is a new federal authority, relatively new, that was packaged in the farm bill that enabled the federal government, the US Forest Service, to enter into agreements with state governments like the California Tahoe Conservancy or CAL FIRE to be able to implement work on federal lands. So this is one of those pieces where as um, federal governments are experiencing less flexibility in terms of growing their workforce or shrinking their workforce based on available funding or project needs, the state can actually be utilized as a key partner to implement that work on federal lands while at the same time implementing complementary work on non-federal lands. Um, and we're entering into some of those agreements right now. Um, the other piece I wanted to add on capacity, and since this is the, the policy forum, I feel like it's really appropriate, is policy guidance typically focuses investments in fire preparation on projects. It invests in projects and it invests in concrete deliverables. And it makes sense why that's the case. But what we experience in terms of building programs to be able to respond to available funding is the focus on those particular projects, which may say fund implementation, but not fund assessment or planning or monitoring or some of the infrastructure and support that we might need in terms of facilities, in terms of equipment, in terms of personnel, administrative staff, those pieces really aren't there. And so we need to take all these different projects and cobble together, okay, how are we gonna build an organization around this? So a shift in focus from the investors level at the federal and state side, from investing in projects to investing in capacity would have a significant impact on our ability to accomplish more work. There's a, a combination of all of them for the federal government. We do have typically lower wages than some of our partnering agencies. Um, local fire protection districts pay quite a bit more. Um, there's been a decreased interest in some of the natural resource fields. And third is the, the amount of funding for the agency has gone down and the jobs just aren't available. As we've seen people retire from these positions, they go unfilled and there's no thoughts of rehiring people into those positions. It's also really expensive to live in Tahoe, and we are finding in general that kind of wage grade people aren't wanting to move here because there's nowhere to live. We're finding that at even high salaries at, at, at the agency I work at, we are having a hard time filling positions because you can't find anywhere to live, which is a big deal. I was just gonna add Forrest, um, attracting contractors to the region, and you've done a lot of work on that, so that could be worth speaking to this question. These questions are like three questions in one, so I feel like, you know, we should get a little bit more time. But, um, but I think that you could speak on that a little bit more, of because there's not only um, the capacity within the agencies, but it's also contractors, and there's been a real um, lack of interest of folks to come up here and work in the basin because there are so many regulations here and it's more expensive to do treatments on the ground in Tahoe than probably anywhere else in the United States. And so that per acre cost isn't as attractive to get folks to come up here to work. So Forrest has been working on trying to attract more folks to come up. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? How are we doing on, on the question stack? Because I, I, it's important, I think, that we get to everybody's questions, but the yeah, follow-up could be helpful. Okay. <laughs> um, so 
this is something really similar to the utilization question that was asked earlier in terms of when the work that needs to get done exceeds internal agency capacity. We're thinking about what we need to do to provide those tools, not just to purchasers of potential material for biomass, but also those workforces that can help get the work done. But again, that requires private investment in, say, new equipment that can function in the Lake Tahoe Basin, like cut-to-length equipment, which is highly specialized equipment, um, in terms of new personnel. Um, and increasing their capacity to bid on projects maybe outside of the areas where they normally work in. So our focus within the Tahoe Fire and Fuels team is again providing those tools, both in terms of better information flow to contractors and from contractors to us so that we can understand what tools we can better provide um, that will incentivize investments in increasing contractor capacity. Um, that work is initiating, uh, is underway, um, but this year we're initiating a, a contractor workshop as well as processes for a joint request for information. So we have really large bid lists and we're also communicating to all of those prospective bidders, not just one project or another, but actually compiling those projects to be able to communicate out how much work we have coming up in the Lake Tahoe Basin and why we so need the help of private industry to help solve our capacity issues. Okay, great. All right, so these next three are all about uh, safety and evacuation. I'm just gonna read all of them and then if they're related, you can cut them to the pieces. Is there a public safety plan for Tahoe residents to evacuate the basin or identify safety zones? Um, second, how can we as a neighborhood organize and facilitate an evacuation drill like the Golden Bear Pioneer Trail neighborhood did this week. Who do we contact for that? And this one is addressed to Klaus specifically. Do you have any printed materials on fire safety that residents could pass out to out of town visitors in our neighborhoods? So. Well, I guess I'll get started with uh, some of that and probably pass it off to Forrest for some of the evacuation stuff. Um, but we do have the South Lake Tahoe pre-attack plan map, which is in the back, which is not an evacuation plan. This is just identifying areas where we may have ingress, egress issues. It does identify, identify TRAs or temporary refuge areas, so areas you could go when you can't get out. We are really hesitant to ident pre-identify evacuation plans. I've been working with the sheriff. We've been working with Barton Hospital number of other agencies talking about this issue everybody's really hesitant because fire is so dynamic it's really hard to identify a set plan and say all of the even number houses will head out on this street all of the odd number houses will head out on that street because that can change so rapidly in any fire environment that once people get set in this is how i have to go and then that has to change it's much more difficult to change that midstream so what we are working on is coordinating our response, like they're working on Golden Bear today, coordinating our response to be able to get people out effic efficiently and effectively in a timely manner. So one thing that I will say is it's really important that you know your community, know who lives next to you, know the neighbors that might not be able to get themselves out, that might need extra assistance in getting out, so you can help aid in that process. There aren't enough sheriffs, there aren't enough firefighters to go to every single doorstep and help remove every single person from their residence. So being part of a strong community, you can help keep your community safe. And I can tell you from an agency response side, we are working on everything we can. We're learning from the lessons of the campfire, from the lessons of the Napa fires, and some of these things that happen as to how we can get that message out more efficiently, such as no longer you have to opt in to an evacuation notice. You have to opt out of it. So we're changing how we look at things and how we get that messaging out as quickly as possible. And I'll let, uh, and as far as the, the pamphlets, I think that's more of a Tahoe Fire and Fuels team than a Forest Service. There is information that has come out through the fire public information team. Forrest can speak to that a little bit more, but we try and do this interagency. It's not just a federal message, it's a message for all of the agencies and all of the, the residents. And so we put those messages out that way. It's not just us, it's all of the agencies together and, and the communities. Thanks, Kyle. 
So first question was around really getting informed. And there are evacuation plans developed for, I mean, there are emergency preparedness guides with evacuation information available for all of the Lake Tahoe Basin. They're usually specific to geographic regions. Um, I encourage um, anyone with, that's interested to visit tahoe.livingwithfire.info and click on Get Informed. Um, that has checklist information on evacuation readiness, um, but it also has links, depending on where you live, for each of those more specific emergency preparedness guides, which list primary evacuation routes. Um, one of the pieces that's so challenging is that this extends far beyond forest management and community engagement in the, in the realm of the Tahoe Fire and Fuels team to include emergency management, law enforcement, um, Red Cross. There, were, there was recently a community forum hosted by the city of South Lake Tahoe um, and CAL FIRE on emergency preparedness, um, which is uh, available online to stream. And it shows that although we have a lot of information, because of the dynamic nature of wildland fires, the key that agencies are focused on is building the community situational awareness and tools and understanding of wildland fire so that those decisions can be made um, in that very dynamic wildland fire environment in terms of where to go and how to respond. Even though we provide frameworks, agencies provide frameworks on what the most likely evacuation routes are, that can all change in a moment on any given fire. The second piece is about getting involved, and this is great. Big Bear's, the Big Bear neighborhood is running an evacuation drill today, right now. Golden Bear, Golden Bear sorry. Yes. Um, the Golden Bear evacuation drill um, originated from some community members getting involved with the Tahoe Network of Fire Adapted Communities and their local fire protection agencies um, and CAL FIRE, which then identified how can, can me as a resident and as a leader in my community help make the biggest impact I can on, our, on the critical issues facing our community. And it's culminating today with that evacuation drill. Um, so also, sorry to plug the website so many times, but there's so much good information there tahoe.livingwithfire.info and clicking on Get Involved will provide contact forms um, and the ability to get connected with the Tahoe Network, where one's kind of seeing what you're focused on and what you'd like to do. Um, the Tahoe Network will connect you to the appropriate staff at local fire departments or at CAL FIRE or otherwise to be able to carry some forward some of that work in your community. And it's something that we're really excited when community members step up to, um, to take on that work. Uh, at the higher level of policies, what would you say the top three things that the federal government can do to aid forest resiliency? Funding, funding, funding. <laughs> yeah. I, really, right now, it it is a it is a lack of, of funding in getting in front of this problem. Uh, we kind of realize that right now the pace we're treating the landscape at is not keeping up with the pace it's burning at, and. We've, we're trying to get policy in place that is, is changing how we do it. I talked about that categorical exclusion, which doubled how much work we were able to get done in one environmental document. So that was a big change. We, we were previously able to do 1,500 acres mechanical and 3,000 by hand, and then that kind of doubled that. So it doubled the amount of work we could get done in, this, in the same document, but we need to keep pushing that direction and changing how some of the regulations are impacting the treatments that are occurring. Um, I know Tina and, and TRPA, they've, Christina and TRPA, they've been working on what can we do to help expedite some of these processes and make them more efficient, like getting mechanical equipment onto steeper slopes is really going to benefit the Lake Tahoe Basin and the amount of treatment we can do and the amount of follow-up treatment that has to occur. So there are changes taking place, it's just they take a lot of time and I don't know that there is some type of major policy change that's going to help expedite all of this, 
what we really need to see is a funding source that we can count on every year and we know is not going to decline from one year to the next and that it's something where we can plan ahead for five or ten years knowing we're going to have that consistent source of funding pushing forward so we can plan for future treatments. I would, would add that, you know, these types of issues can't be solved from one level of the government. It, it has to be happening local, state, and federal. And that's what the, all of the work that the forest leads with the Tall Fire and Fuels team is really coordinating all of the agencies in the basin so that we can come together to address these from the top down and the bottom up. And something that we haven't really touched on much is we're really trying to plan these projects at the landscape scale, not at the project scale anymore. And by doing that, it makes the planning quicker. We can share the effort to get funding. We attract more people to come and work here because we have larger projects. So they could say, oh, well, I will go up there and work if that means I can work on 10,000 acres instead of 300 acres. It attracts use of the biomass because we have a lot more of it going out of the forest. So we can say, hey, why don't you guys bid on our project? Because we can tell you we are treating 20,000 acres in the next eight years or less. And so really it's that coordination um, among all of the partners to really work together to decrease costs and increase the efficiencies of our work. Real quick, can I just add to something Christina said? It just, we are fortunate in Lake Tahoe. I don't want to paint a negative picture in all of this. We have the Southern Nevada Public Land Management Act that has provided a tremendous amount of funding to this area to produce the amount of fuels reduction work we have. Most areas do not have access to funds like that. And because of that, we have been able to tr treat a tremendous amount of land that most other places typically wouldn't be able to get to. The Tahoe Fire and Fuels team has been looked at as a, as a model s statewide as to how can we recreate this to get this amount of work done moving forward. Question, the urban forest of South Lake Tahoe is as dense as forest in the Wuli, which have been thin. How can it be uh, effectively thin as we are seeing in the Wuli? Um, and the fires can begin, of course, in the urban forest. Uh, a related question, are there ways to have residents treat brush on adjacent public lands? I know that was addressed a bit, especially urban lots. And a, another one was, what about all these wooden degraded fences in the way? How can we make them go away? <laughs> Okay, well, we did talk a little bit about stewardship, um, and there is a process by contacting the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit, 543-2600. They can put you in touch with our urban lots management program or any of our vegetation staff. And we do have a permitting process that will give you guidelines on the type of work that you can do in the adjacent lots. But we encourage everybody to do that. We know that we've treated all of the lots, but there's always treatment that needs to, to continue, that trees fall down every year, that pine needles can be raked up to improve your defensible space. So please uh, contact our staff and we'd be more than happy to sign you up to go ahead and get those permits and show you the type of work that can be done. If you do have a lot that's requiring additional work that you aren't able to do, sometimes we have hazard trees. We have folks that go out every year looking for hazard trees, but we can't get to every single piece of land. So if you'd please call in a hazard tree, you have a dead tree in the lot next to you that you're worried about, they'd be happy to come out and take a look and determine if it poses an immediate threat or something that can be delayed a little bit. And if it's an immediate threat, we will go ahead and take care of that and pay for the removal of, of that tree. So we, we were, we're doing everything we can on the federal lands to try and help create that defensible space, knowing that most people don't have 100, people of, 100 feet of defensible space on their lot alone, and oftentimes you'll have adjacent state or forest lands. Okay, so the 
first part of my answer will be from the perspective of the Tahoe Fire and Fuels team, and then I'll provide some information on state lands and the conservancy. Um, the public land management agencies and the fire districts have developed a process for implementing work in neighborhoods across boundaries. And again, that's with aligning the defensible space work that residents are completing with the work of public land management agencies so that we can have continuous defensible space. Um, something like the recently passed El Dorado County Ordinance for vacant lots is actually an incredibly useful tool for being able to effectuate outreach and assistance around the treatment of vacant lots. Because there's one piece that we don't talk about very much um, and is really elevated as a priority, is in addition to all of the Forest Service and state-owned vacant lots within neighborhoods, there are as many privately owned vacant lots. Now, 95% of the publicly owned vacant lots have received at least one treatment um, for fuel reduction. Very few of the privately owned vacant lots have been managed for fuel reduction and for fire behavior. So when we consider it, we need to consider both defensible space as required by Public Resource Code 4291, along with vacant lot clearing on both public and private lot ownerships. Um, we've submitted multiple funding requests and have a small amount of funding to be able to support that work in private neighborhoods where the community assistance work and the public lands work can occur concurrently to really shift that landscape. The next piece of the question is on stewardship. So now I'm going to put my Tahoe Conservancy hat on. And the Forest Service does allow for um, stewardship of lots. And this can be really important because in between the treatments that agencies conduct, which might be conducted every 10 years or so to really thin the trees, provide that major work on brush thinning, et cetera, we have brush regrowth, we have sapling regrowth, um, we have additional litter and dead fuel accumulation within those lots. And those are pieces that typically we request of private um, residential landowners with, for defensible space to be maintained frequently. Um, the Conservancy doesn't have that tool available. And this is one of those pieces where the differences in state and federal policy can provide some challenges in providing consistent management recommendations and processes across different property ownerships. Um, the, with the the strategy adopted by those public land management agencies and the fire districts has emphasized the importance of providing stewardship opportunities and providing consistent methods and prescriptions and treatments across property ownerships. Um, so it's something where um, we recognize that state policy is currently providing some barriers to be providing the same stewardship opportunities on state lands. Um, the knowing and hearing from the community that it's important and will provide those benefits is something um, we at the Conservancy are very interested in hearing about. Okay. We have about uh, 10 questions in 10 minutes, so we're going to go into the lightning round. Rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one minute. Here we go. Boom. Hold the card up already. This one I think is easy for one minute. How are fire spotting cameras placed throughout Tahoe uh, lands? How effective have they been? Okay, we'll go quick on this one. Um, we've worked with Desert Research Institute and tried to determine where we would have an effective view for the entire Lake Tahoe Basin. The cameras were placed so that we could also triangulate the fire. So we have multiple cameras in multiple locations that can see the same spot so we can actually determine a lat long and get firefighters there quickly. And they've been extremely effective in uh, helping us identify fires that would normally have taken us much longer to determine their location. So it's been a real benefit to the basin. Great. Well, now it's like bonus, like 30 seconds. <laughs> Tell me to be quick. I'll be okay. quick. Some areas <laughs> of the forest have been treated. I think you mentioned 80% of uh, the Wooly. Um, when will, be, when will fire be used in these areas, uh, perhaps you could say again, before fuels increase? When will they go back for retreatment in places to go? So the goal to get in with prescribed fire is within 10 to 20 years. So we've started doing that in several locations. Um, Baldwin Meadow would be one that we were just able to get back into. 
it's a lofty goal. We don't really have the capacity to do that and do all of the initial treatments, but that would be our ideal situation is re revisiting these areas within 10 to 20 years with prescribed fire. Let's just keep you with the microphone. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Hel Healthy Forest Restoration Act, I think, Forrest, you mentioned that. Is this only for Forest Service mm -hmm. land or is BLM included as well? Um, BLM is included within the Healthy Forest Restoration Act. CWPPs must, community wildfire protection plans must be made in consultation with whatever federal government um, landowner is represented. Oh, you guys are getting good. Better come on with some more questions. We're gonna run out. <laughs> uh, after the Paradise Fire, Trump threatened to uh, withhold federal funds for forest management. Did that happen? That did not happen. And yeah, <laughs> okay, um, back to the safety question. Um, why is uh, there not, not uh, more not being done to keep all lanes on 50 open through the casino corridor when needed for evacuation? I guess you could say any, any of our major roadways. And I know there are people who have related concerns about the amount of traffic, so any, any thoughts on evacuation and traffic and road conditions? Forrest could probably speak to this as well, but there's been a lot of discussion regarding evacuation. Um, we aren't a national park. We don't have the ability to limit the amount of traffic coming in and coming out of Lake Tahoe. It provides you know, a lot of the economy for this area, so that is a, a difficulty. We have road construction that has to occur, so part of what we do is we discuss where all that's occurring and potential options to kind of eliminate that hazard or mitigate that hazard, realizing it's always gonna be there. We're trying to kind of just stay in front of it a little bit, talk to the sheriff, talk to the fire protection districts, know where those things are occurring and potential options to help mitigate those areas. Okay, I might be able to give you guys a 30 second break on to respond to this question myself. Uh, do we know if Liberty Utilities will be turning off electricity on risky windy days and how will the community be notified? So I work at Liberty Utilities. <laughs> Good, because I don't want to cover that one. <laughs> um, a couple quick things. We're kind of proposing a vast increase in our own fuels reduction projects around uh, power lines. We're all seeing uh, the risks with ignitions there. This next one, the Utility Commission is mandating all utilities to have put de-energization plans, power shutoff uh, plans, and we're developing our own as well. The goal would be to have like 48 hours of notice that this is coming. It's a special concern for people who rely on electricity for medical devices and so forth. So there are a lot of things to be thought through, but kind of the, the obvious conclusion after say the Paradise Campfire is better to, to be pro, uh, pro, preempt, proactive and err on the side of caution. So that, uh, so there, there will be more of that statewide, probably including in our service territory. You're welcome to talk to me afterward. We have various public input processes on that, so. Um, i just add to that real quick. Yeah, Liberty yeah. has been great. They've been working with us to try and treat all of the power lines on the California side, and we're hoping to have that project done this year and possibly implement as early as this summer. It's been something that larger utility companies have been really interested in SDG&E, and some of those large places are trying to model something after what Liberty's been doing with the, the Forest Service and other land management agencies. Well, thank you. Um, I, I would add, we also, on the biomass bit, uh, we went in on a grant with the North Star Community Services District, public works for the community around North Star to get funding for a biomass gasification plant that would, be, that would have been under a substation by North Star. Um, that would have helped address the issue of the cost of the energy because the, uh, the actual capital plant would have been paid for with public forest health funds, uh, bringing the cost of the energy down more in line with other sources, other renewable sources like solar or wind. That was not funded, but it could be a model that could be used elsewhere. In that case, we were planning to put it right at a substation, which would have served important electrical, electrical distribution purposes. So continue to look at solutions like that. Um, I know that, I just wanted, to, I'll just ask the question, I know that it was addressed a bit within the, the evacuation question, but are public land managers creating safety zones essential during evacuations? I think that may have been addressed before, but I just want to reiterate the answer. 
Yeah, I, I think there's a few different things you can look at. We have identified areas that are safe. So I wouldn't say we're creating these areas. We're utilizing areas that have been created. However, our fuels reduction treatments do create areas that are safer areas for people to be. For example, in the Angora fire, with all of the structures that were burning down, the firefighters felt the safest in our urban lots. They were using the urban lots that we had treated as areas that they could go to when the other places were getting too hot and they didn't feel safe. So these fuels reduction treatments, um, some of the mechanical treatment areas, are decreasing fire behavior to the point that they become safer areas. Would I recommend that the public go utilize these areas rapidly? No, I wouldn't. I would say that utilize pre-established temporary refuse areas like the South Lake Tahoe Airport is a big, large, open area where I would feel extremely safe in any fire. Okay, um, this is, gets into the fuel uh, reduction uh, pr uh, treatment protocol, I think, um, which was the concern that, uh, clear, about clear cutting as a, as a method. So the question is, how is clear cutting justified for the well-being of the human population when we know that the loss of trees and other vegetation can cause climate change, desertification, soil erosion, fewer crops, flooding, increased greenhouse, increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and a host of other problems? Sure. I mean, um, so certainly clear cutting is not a common practice um, at all in the Tahoe Basin. No areas are clear cut. Uh, in the state of California, you are not allowed to have a cut larger than 20 acres in size in the rules in the state of California. So um, it's unlike other states in the West where you can have very large, especially in Pacific Northwest, Oregon, and Washington, you can have very large clearings. A, a majority of the fuels work here in the basin um, isn't even really logging. It is uh, removing small trees in the, in, in the understory that are not being sold, right? So this is why it's expensive. And single tree selection, so removing individual larger trees out of the forest, but not removing all of the trees in any given area. Okay, a question about, uh, do you know about the, the CAL FIRE has an extensive list of cities considered very uh, uh, high uh, hazardous zones for fire and the suggestion that there were places included that don't seem very, like very high fire risk, like Palm Springs and Palm Deserts. Um, do you know, you know how these places are determined and do you feel like the list is accurate? Do you have, yeah, um, so the hazard severity zones have implications for what sort of building codes apply throughout the state defensible space requirements, et cetera. It's developed by CAL FIRE's Forest and Resource Assessment Program. And because it is at a state level, it's highly dependent on remote sensing data um, and other available data in order to be able to make those determinations. Um, I think there are areas where if you zoom into a particular community or neighborhood, you might say, ah, that doesn't match up quite well with, with, with what my experience is or what I know of an area. Um, the Fire and Resource Assessment Program for CAL FIRE is actually updating the fire hazard severity zone um, determinations based on new available remote sensing data. Um, so there should be a little bit more site-specific accuracy, but it's always important to know that those statewide assessments will often be of, of limited value once you get down to the neighborhood or home scale. I know that the way that they determined these priority project areas had to do with the density of the community and like how many humans are being impacted in that area. And I believe that sensitive, um, it was also like elderly populations, um, English as a second language. So a lot went into it, not just the fire risk, it was also the risk adjacent to the communities of people. Okay, we're gonna get through the final two questions. Uh, Kyle.
Uh, real quick to you, does the Forest Service have any role in the installation of 5G cellular networks with the concern that the number of them went up in paradise after the fire and just wondered if there was a, a, a forest, a 5G cellular uh, connection or issue? We do not have anything to do with 5G connections. Um, they, there is a permitting process. People can come request sites and that can go through our lands department and permit it. But we aren't actively engaging in any of that right now as, as far as I know. Um, I can say I know that there are so there's some resistance to some of these sites. However, these are also the sites that help us maintain communications. So despite some of the bad, there's, there's good with them also. And I just can say that right now, we aren't actively engaged in installing any of them. Okay, final question, we did it. Um, so and if, if there were some questions that were kind of very close to other ones. So hopefully, even if you had your question was not read, it was answered in some other way. So and if not, I think that uh, at least a couple of the panelists are going to be here for another 30 minutes, so you can be welcome to come up and ask them directly questions that were not answered. But the final one, the Senate Bill 901, how are barriers being reduced for private land owners for fuel reduction projects? Um, so Senate Bill 901 for private land owners introduced modifications to existing exemptions and brand new exemptions for the Forest Practice Act. So what does that mean practically? It means that if you are a private landowner and you'd like to implement a project on your land, or as before, it may have been a much more expensive process, or if you say wanted to use equipment or build new roads in order to be able to do that work, you'd have to go through a long, complex timber harvesting plan process. Those new exemptions provide a much more streamlined way to accomplish those pieces. Um, the state offers many more incentive opportunities, and if you're interested in some of those, let me know. All right, well, final round of applause. Come on up and talk. Thanks, thanks to all of you for coming and spending time here today. I just want to give a, a really quick, uh, again, thanks to the, uh, the, the panelists, but really want to call out Nancy Gibson. Uh, this was Nancy's brain. Uh, she did all the hard work behind this. And I would be really remiss if I didn't add this last point since this is a climate change forum. That right now I want everyone to, to understand that these type of fire meetings are probably taking place all over the Southwest. We have, I'm imagining similar meetings taking place in the Midwest as it relates to flooding. I remember, I can imagine very similar meetings taking place on the Eastern Seaboard for hurricanes. Florida, as their city becomes inundated with water, you have water issues as it relates to climate change. Climate change is a theme that runs through all of these things. It is not being addressed quickly or fast enough. The economic models that are, have been used by opponents for years are disingenuous and dishonest. We can do this and we can do it now. We need the will and fundamentally what I want to work with everyone in this room and every panelist is to create that will and thank you so much for coming today.